Hi everybody, it's a very nice to be part of this first edition of the Richmond Irish Festival. So the first piece was a traditional Irish piece called The Foggy Dew, uh, one of many tunes and variations of tunes with that name. Uh, and it's a very old tune, before the 1700s. Uh, up until the 1700s, uh, in fact the end of the 1700s, all mu Irish music was passed on orally. It was not transcribed. And uh, in 1792, for the first time, a young man by the name of Edward Bunting, who was 19 years old at the time, a classically trained musician, he was given a commission to tra transcribe the music for the first time, to write it down. And he attended a vet, an event in 1792 called the Belfast Harp Festival, which brought together the last remaining traditional harpers uh, of the Celtic world. There were 11 of them. Uh, ten were Irish, one was a Welshman, and it was said at the time that he was, uh, while a very pretty player, he didn't know very much about Irish music, it was said. Anyway, no fault of his own, he knew about Welsh, I guess. Uh, and there was one woman among them as well at that Belfast Harp Festival. Her name was Rose Mooney from County Meath. And almost half of the Harpers were blind. Five of the eleven were blind. Uh, one of them was 97 years old as well, so uh, 1792, you can do the math. And so they come together at these festivals to, to perform, to compete for money, uh, but also for the first time to have their music transcribed and try to preserve this, this way of life which was dying out. <clears throat> so in Ireland, as well as in Europe, from the earliest times, there was a tradition of blind musicians. And you think back to Greek mythology, to the Homeric epics, there was a Tiresias, who was the prophet and seer, who was blind and played a lyre. Uh, in the Celtic world, harpers or harpists, harpers that's more a, maybe a traditional word, nowadays we say harpists, were um, highly honored in society and they were seen as the carriers of tradition, of culture, of history. And the blind harpists were honored as much as their sighted colleagues, if not more so, because it was felt that people who could not see in the outer world had a, perhaps a sharper inner vision and deeper insight into um, other worlds, inner worlds, and what we might say today is other levels of consciousness. So a lot of the, tra the traditional Irish music that you hear, uh, traditional airs, laments, ballads, uh, jigs, dances, although written down for the first time in 1792 and throughout the 1800s, uh, dated from a much earlier period, a period that went back into the mists of time, into the foggy dew. <laughs>
So that was a series of two pieces. Uh, the first was called Chanter, and it was named, it's an all traditional Irish piece, named for the part of the bagpipe, the tube with the finger holes that's used to play the melody. So it's the chanter of the bagpipe, and you might have heard the drone that I played in the, in the left hand. And the second piece was called the Aaron Boat Song, and it was an arrangement by an American uh, harpist and educator called Lori Riley, the Aaron Boat Song. So the Aaron Boat Song was either named or from, I don't quite know the history of the song, but named for the Aran Islands, uh, which are located to the west of Ireland. There's three of them, three of these islands, near Galway Bay. And the three islands, in order of size, from largest to smallest, are Inishmore, Inishman, and Inishir. And uh, there's traces of human habitation on these islands uh, predating Christian times, you know, from very, very early times in history, before recorded history. Uh, they were very popular islands with the early Christian uh, monks and missionaries, if you want to call them that. And the very first true Irish uh, monastery was actually founded on Inishmore, the largest of the Aran Islands, in the 5th century by Enda of Iran. 5th yeah, century, so 400s. He was a contemporary of Patrick. And uh, there are at least a dozen ruins of old monasteries on these islands. It might be a couple of dozen, I'm not quite sure. Uh, St. Brendan visited them and apparently had a blissful vision on one of the islands. And St. Columba called the islands the Sun of the West. Um.
So I just played a series of three tunes. And so the first was called uh, High Germany, a traditional Irish piece. And that was followed by an arrangement I did of a, a more modern song, a very modern song called Tir na Nog, that was uh, made famous and actually one of the songs of Celtic Woman, if you know of that group. And Tir na Nog, of course, was the Irish other world, the land of eternal youth and the land of gods. And one of many other worlds in Irish, uh, ancient Irish culture. It wasn't just one. Uh, the first two pieces were in a minor key, in A minor, and then we moved into the major with a C major, and we moved into a 6-8 meter with Shibeg Shimor. Now that piece might have been familiar to some of you. It was um, reputed to be the first piece ever composed by the very famous Irish harper O'Carolan, who was himself blind, and uh, who composed some of the most memorable and beautiful melodies in Irish music. So he lived from about uh, 1670, I believe, till 1738, something like that. And as I mentioned, very, very well-known, uh, beautiful uh, melodies they composed. And this particular one, called Shebeg Shimor, was named for two very small hills, or you might call them large mounds, small hills in County Leitrim, which were reputed to be the home of the fairies. Or we wouldn't have said the fairies, we would have said the good people. And if you wanted to catch a glimpse of the good people, well, then you would climb to the top of one of the hills on Halloween or on Beltane, 1st of May, because as everybody knew, that was when the curtain that divided this world from the other ones was at its thinnest. And so you might see some uh, fairy or a spirit of some sort at Shebeg Shemor in County Leitrim. But in even older Irish legend, this Shebeg and Shemor was the site of a very fierce battle between um, the warriors of the great King Finn McCool and a rival group. And uh, it was a very desperate, uh, desperate fight. And Finn McCool's men lost. And one of his greatest heroes died and was supposed to be buried under the hill of Shebeg. And the, uh, the best fighter on the other side also died and was buried under the hill of Shemor. Some people claim that it's actually the burial site of the great Finn McCool himself. There's no way to say for sure. But there are some cairns on the top of the hill of Shebeg. And uh, they were excavated. And they found two skeletons, a man and a woman. And their bodies were placed facing the ancient royal seat of Tara. I'd just like to uh, say a few words about the harps at the time of O'Carolan and before, so uh, before the 1700s. So Irish harps were smaller than they are today. In 1792, uh, Rose Mooney was playing a 33-string harp, but that would have been considered a rather large harp. So 33 strings is just over uh, four octaves. Probably the more regular size would have been at 26 strings, just over uh, three octaves. And uh, they were, the strings were made of, of metal, of brass, so they would have resonated very differently. And um, the actual, um, the actual uh, resonating chamber of the harp would have been uh, carved out of a single log. And from what I've read, it was often willow. So very, very different. It would have had a very, very different sound than today. Also, the strings were plucked with, but with nails. So harpers had very, very long nails. And let's see, I have very short nails. And I don't pluck the strings with my nails. I, I, I just sort of rub the strings with the side of my fingers like that. So the, it, there's a very different sound now that the harps have today. Uh, they would have been tuned differently. They would have resonated differently. And my harp, which you might notice uh, in the video, has a series of levers at the top of the strings. And that, the levers, if I push, put one or two, put them up, I can play in different tunes because it raises the uh, tone by a semitone, raises the string by a semitone. So that allows me to play in different keys. But that wouldn't have been the case with traditional harps. And my harp is a 38-string harp, so five strings more than Rose had back in 1792. And it was made in Kingston by a man named Tat Stanley from uh, locally sourced cherry wood uh, and also Sitka spruce from the BC. And there's also some ash in there for its strength to reinforce the wood inside the harp because there's so much tension on the strings.
So the piece you just heard was a composition by the American harpist and uh, educator Lori Riley. I mentioned her earlier. She did one of the arrangements. Uh, Lori is very active in, um, in therapeutic music, which is music that's played in a medical setting, and not to heal people, but to relax and soothe people and make them more open uh, for the treatments that they're receiving. So it lowers blood, pre uh, blood, blood pressure. I was going to say blood sugar, blood pressure and other things like that. And so Lori is actually not only involved in that field, but she is a, a teacher of a, a great many therapeutic musicians in the States and uh, some in Canada here too. <clears throat> so um, one thing I haven't mentioned yet uh, is that uh, the harp is the national emblem of Ireland. Uh, it, it's, you know, we see it on, on cans of Guinness, but many other places too. And that's been true for a very, very long time throughout history. It's a source of pride. An, an identity. Uh, interestingly, the harp was first uh, found in Egypt, and the Celts discovered it by way of the Phoenicians, who were traders. And you remember, uh, you know, very, very long time ago, the Celts were all around Europe before they were pushed back into, into the corners, into Ireland, Scotland, Wales, Brittany, uh, Galicia, and Spain. So a great emblem, the, the, the Celts uh, at the time, they adopted it as their own and Celtic harpists ha became very well known across Europe for their, their beautiful style and technique and of course melodies. And uh, that was true uh, until the Middle Ages and uh, the harp became a, a symbol of almost resistance against the English because as you know, there were conflicts that went on for a great number of years, if not centuries, between the Irish and the English. In 1531, Henry VIII declared himself the King of Ireland. We won't go into discussing that, but just to show you to what point uh, the, uh, the harp was a symbol of Ireland, he had the harp stamped on the coinage. Um, and every king and every chieftain in the Celtic world had their own harpist the, the, you know, at court, uh, who was not necessarily the same person as the poet. It was the official poet, the official harpist. Um, but we talk about Henry VIII, 1531, but by the end of the 1500s, the English crown began to see the harp as a threat because it was such a symbol of Irish pride and, and Celtic feeling. And so the harp was banned at the end of the 1500s. It was banned. Harpists were per persecuted, uh, condemned. Some of them were executed. Harps were burnt. It was to tell you the power of music. Um... So harpers had to go underground, as it were, and they became itinerant musicians. Of course, they were loved by the people, so they were always given a home wherever they went. But it was a, you know, it was a, a moment of decline for the, the tradition of Irish harping. Still, despite all that, uh, the harp survived, and harp music survived, until we heard in 1792, with the 11 remaining harpists, really 10, because one was a Welshman, the effort to begin to record the music. And we only have less than a dozen uh, harps that date prior to 1700s. And the oldest is from the 15th century, from, so from the 1400s. And it's kept on display at Trinity College in Dublin. So if you're ever visiting, you should pop in and have a look. I haven't seen it myself. I'd like to. And there's another two harps dating from this period, or roughly the 15th century, that are kept by the National Museum in Scotland. And one of them is called the Queen Mary Harp, and it is very beautiful. Once again, I haven't seen it in person. Maybe you have, and if you have, aren't you lucky? <laughs> so, to just finish off, the next piece is a traditional French folk song. And this is in honor of the Irish who crossed the Atlantic to come and establish themselves here in Quebec uh, in the hopes of a better life. And also in honor of the French-speaking population here who welcomed the Irish into their communities, into their homes, uh, often into their families. Many Irish orphans, as many of you will know, were adopted by uh, French Canadian families, and many Irish married into families. Many of them. This is an interesting. This is an interesting little thing. Uh, after 1760, after the Plains of Abraham, um, the English took possession of Quebec, and a certain time amount of time afterwards, they issued an amnesty for everyone who had fought against them, except the Irish. <laughs> so at that point, the Irish uh, changed their names, or they were greatly motivated to change their names and uh, franciser, to franciser their names so that they would not be a target of any sort of retribution. 
So a French folk song, which I think you'll recognize, I will not name in honor of both the Irish and the French of Quebec. And it's followed by uh, another piece uh, written, uh, a traditional piece known as Come by the Hills for the lyrics that were written uh, in the, in the uh, 20th century uh, to a much older melody. So I'd like to thank uh, all the organizers of this Richmond Irish Festival for inviting me and for all their hard work. And I'd like to thank all the members of the production team, the technical team who are putting this all together. It is a lot of hard work, that too. I really appreciate it. And thanks to all of you for listening. Mm -hmm.